can never say I wouldn't come back to this. I've been doing it 20 years. It's all I've known for 20 years. It's, it, it's what I did for 20 years. Imagine the belt that I got is mine. Who's going to take that from me? You know, imagine someone was like, yo, we need that belt back. Okay, come get it. <laughs> you know, what Francis just did right now is, is crazy. You know, like insane, bro, that he pulled that off. brand new episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. I'm so excited to be speaking to my guest this week. He is a legend and icon of the fight game. Recently retired, he is now a full-blown promoter. He is the one and only Jorge Gamebred Mars Vidal. Jorge, how you doing, my man? Very good, my friend. How you doing? I'm fantastic. Jorge, you know what I'd love to do just to kind of to start with? We'll get to the year that you've had. But the last time I spoke to you, and I don't know if you remember this or not, but it was prior to the Darren Till fight. I was working for ESPN at the time. It was in the BT Tower to kind of like, mm -hmm. it was a media day to kind of announce oh, yeah. the fight and announce the event. And I always think, when I think about 2019, I think about you because that was your year. You owned that year. But if you could go back in time and, and speak to yourself prior to the Darren Till fight, what would you say? Because what you had in 2019 was an incredibly phenomenal year and it kind of had a massive domino effect in terms of the success you've had since then. But what would you say, say to yourself if you, if you could go back in time and speak to that guy? Stay on track and don't get off track you when this corona crap comes around or <laughs> something like that. I would have said, you know, that, that, that corona stuff, like most of us, uh, it... it uh, you know, threw a lot of us off. And um, yeah, man, freaking 2019 was a good year. I put a lot of work, uh, 16 years worth of work for that one year to be able to break records, snatch titles and, and sell numerous favorite views, you know, so it was a great year. Yeah, it's, it's quite rare for someone that's so deep into their professional c career to have the type of success that you had in 2019. I mean, from the outside looking in, I can only put it down to mindset. Would that be accurate? Yeah, hundred percent. Mindset, experience. Um, you know, I, I was fighting for 16 years, and I started fighting before like fighting was like cool, cool. You know, like like that. So when I was fighting, it, it, it was amazing. So, but a lot of times we didn't, you know, except if you were in the big show the UFC, which I didn't get into later till I was 27, 28. I, I bounced all over the world. I, fought in Japan, I fought in Russia, um, Costa Rica, South Korea. Like I fought in numerous places all over the world. And, and that gave me tons of experience, you know? And especially back then fights would be taken like short notice, three weeks notice, you know, sometimes 10 days notice. So it was just, it was part of the trend. It was nothing crazy to take a fight in like 12 days notice against somebody across the world. And and compete, especially when when you don't know when your max paycheck is coming. That's something about fighters that are so resilient. It's just that we don't care, man. We're, we're very, um, like, distorted with the view of reality. We think we're going to beat everybody. We'll go across the pond and fight whoever. So when I was fighting, like, a guy on, uh, like Darren Till, and they were asking me to come across the pond, I already knew I, I got to finish this guy. I got to kill him if I'm going to have any success. Because if I beat him up for five rounds, I'm going to lose. I've been here, done that before already. Or I'm the guy that gets flown in, you know? So the, the, there's in those 16 years, though, what you said is true. Like, if you haven't made it yet, you're probably not. But I also had a lot of pros on my side. I, I, I kind of knew outcomes in, in, you know, different situations where they could look like. So I just went in with everything I had, man. I was preparing very hard for, for that moment. And thank God I got my hand raised. Yeah, like, you know, you're about three three months or so removed from, from being retired. But... When you look back at your career, like, do you think that is your legacy? Is is someone that kept chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, and then had the moment that every fighter is looking for, where you can achieve major success from financial to respect, everything that is involved in the success you had in 2019. You know, definitely. Um, th there's other times in my career that I think are very like pivotal and important that I wouldn't have had that not happened. This wouldn't have happened. So um, that's a great year, but it's definitely not not everything. You know, I feel like I had a lot of great years before. 
not to the public, to the masses. It was the best year ever. But th there was a lot of years where where I got to do good work, go up against good competition, and, and leave them stiff. You know. Do you feel like you're almost um, a, a part of a group that is the end of an era? Someone that came from the Kimbo Slice backyard brawling, you know, world, and 100%. then becoming a yeah, it's only you. It's like street it's, fighter it's, to professional Kimbo. fighter. It was Kimbo and rest in peace, my 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 boy ain't here no more. And then it was me carrying the torch until me retired. So me's no more longer fighting. That means that era is done, man. Don't let anybody fool you that they were in the backyards with me saying this and that, and that they're still fighting or nothing like that. And a lot of those guys that said they were in the backyards of one. There is one guy, um, he he came a little later after the Kimbo slice, but it was Alex Caceres. He fought with a different group of people in the backyard. But he was fighting the backers, and he's still fighting at the UFC at the highest level. So shout out to my boy Alec Caceres, still doing it big. Like I said, you're you're three months removed from being retired. Are, are you at peace with that decision? Are there any nights where you're kind of thinking, yeah, you know what, I can maybe still do this and put a camp together and let's put a let's get a fight going? Every night, you know what I mean. And I go into the gym, and it's like, uh, like I do really well sometimes. My coaches are like man, you're still moving good, you know, and, and stuff like that. But I, I just know in, like, certain departments it's slowed down. Um, and plus, it's still fresh in my head, so of course I'm going to have emotions. I just want to always stay in shape, stay training is, is part of for my mental health. You know, can I say that I'm retired for life? I can never say I wouldn't come back to this. I've been doing it 20 years. It's all I've known for 20 years. It's, it, it's what I did for 20 years night and day day and night so that that habit itself will be hard to break i think at some point i will come back I, I just i don't see it anytime soon yeah i mean that's just how mma retirements usually go you know we see fighters retire and then all of a sudden a year or two years later we see them make a comeback but you're a special case because when i look at the the, the potential money on the table for some big fights i'm like the connor fight hasn't happened there's a potential nate diaz rematch there's a maybe a leon fight there there's just so many great stories and big blockbuster fights i i just think how could you not come back at some point and and kind of have these fights that are still there on the table for you um good question man i mean i'm not trying to fight you know but i'm not against a ginormous pay like let's say the biggest paycheck i've ever gotten in my life you multiply that by like 10 then yeah who am i to say no to generation who up you know but as of right now for fighting even any of those names that you mentioned i i don't i don't care bro i'm, I'm all right you know now you see would have to make me an offer that that's very enticing and we all know how the ufc is i love them to death but man you know they're, they're very savvy businessmen you know they don't like to give out anything over there for for any uh, body. So it's, it's tough negotiating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, speaking of the promotion, you, like I said, at the beginning of the introduction, you are also now a promoter. You've been in the promotion business for three years. And you correct me if I'm wrong here, there's this icon, there's game bread boxing, there's game bread bare knuckle MMA. And that was all under the game bread umbrella. Is that right? Yes, sir. So yes, sir. I mean, uh, I love fighting. It's all, it's all I, I know. You know, it's, it's um, it's what my fan base knows what me expects is, is working out, competing, violence. And maybe I can't perform at that level no more, but I can still put on some of the best fights on, on planet Earth. And, and with a twist, you know, and some of them having these MMA versus MMA guys in boxing. Um, and then eventually we're going to have some good boxers against some good MMA guys. And then bringing the bare knuckle to you, like Junior Dos Santos versus Fabricio Redoom, September 8th from Jacksonville, Florida at the White Star Arena. I mean, I just want to keep people on the edge of the seat with the promoting game, much like when I was fighting, you know. So I feel I could do a great job at this. I've worn all the hats that you could possibly wear in MMA, from talent myself to being a corner man, to being a sparring partner, to being a coach, to being a referee in amateur competitions to now being a promoter and i've also managed and helped get a lot of guys deals and stuff so i've literally won every hat that there is in mma i feel um promoting might be my best and, and most natural of, of, of the hats that i could wear and like you said a 20-year career in the fight game as a professional fighter but you could be a promoter for the next 30 40 50 years so long term yeah you know this is something that you could do for the rest of your life when did you know you know 
I want to start a promotion. I want to, be, you know, get into the fight game as a promoter. When did that kind of seed get planted for you? You know, I did the first couple events and uh, they were right after Corona when we started with the GFC and we were selling out. Granted, it was right after Corona. People were dying to do anything. We went to Mississippi. It was in a lot of competition. But we were selling out. But besides selling out, the interactions that I was having with the crowds after, like their their joy for the event after, like how much they got entertained, like people. And it was during Corona, you know, so people were telling me really sweet things like, bro, I haven't been out of the house and entertained in and I can't tell you when this was like the best thing. Thank you. The whole two hours, I was just glued to the to the fights. You know, and I had a lot of interaction with people like that. So I started saying, I got something here. I think I think people are gonna like it. And that was like the test shot of it. Then uh, we came out with Roy Nelson versus Dylan Cleveland. People loved it. I think it's one of the best bare knuckle fights I've ever seen to this day. And it's just growing and catching more heat. And anyways, wh whenever I say like, hey man, there's two pros fighting, and they're taking out the gloves. It doesn't even matter about the names. It's just like you, you can't help but watch, you know, because you know what a bare knuckle fight, a submission can happen like this or a KO can happen like this. So it's uh, it's been amazing for me, especially as a promoter. I'm the only one doing it. I'm the only one that's doing full MMA rules with no gloves. There's all the types of promotion doing different stuff. Mine is, is the sport of MMA, just minus no gloves, you know, adding I actually, more. Food. I actually wanted to ask you, like, who does who do you think that favors more? not having the glove, just being bare knuckle. Is it the grappler or is it the striker? Or do you think there's pros to, to either and both? There's both, because right, you can throw a right hand and break the guy's orbit on the first round, but you also fractured like maybe your wrist. You know, now your grip strength isn't that good and he manages to take you down and now you, you can't step in out of push him. Ah, it's fighting, man. I can't really say this or that. You know, also you might give one point to the guy and, and with no gloves, that means the cuts come easier. And you bloody him up bad and it just looks bad for the ref. So you end up winning on either cut stoppage or, or just looks so bad that the, the judges are giving it to you. I, I think th there's advantages to both there. And like you said, you've done both boxing and Bernacle MMA. Uh, speaking Dr. of Austin, grappling, yeah. I, speaking of grappling, I'm going to break it here. Um, I got a huge grappler that hopefully within weeks we can make the announcement. Uh, we told you we have big news and then we gave you JDS versus. Fabricio Verdun, we got a great grappler that's going to break the internet. We're bringing him on over for a long-term deal. Um, we're going to break the internet with this guy, and he wants to fight bare knuckle, and he wants to fucking submit people left and right, if not punch their face in. So I'm excited to announce this guy. Once we get all the paperwork filled out, everything gets done, we're going to announce the name of this um, world-class grappler. I love hearing this as well, because every time you do an interview, you've always got something to announce, you know, either a fight that you've signed or a fight or an event. This is all very exciting stuff. Um, I was going to ask you about the boxing. How different is it working and operating in the boxing world as a promoter compared to, say, MMA? Very different, you know, and especially if you get at the higher levels, like if you're dealing with the higher level guys, the, the pay structure set up different. Um, what boxers could get, and, and there's no messing around. It's called the Muhammad Ali Act, and it's there for a reason. It's there to protect fighters. So there, there's a lot of things you can and can't do, but it's it's amazing. It's something that I've I've grown um, very close to since a kid because I've always been good friends with boxers, boxing promoters. I've had a lot of boxing coaches who were fighters themselves, so I've always known about the boxing game and the promoting game. So. Um, I love it, man. It's it's different than the UFC, so I know both worlds very well. Very different worlds, you know, what you could get in terms of here or there. But MMA is starting to grow and get bigger and bigger as, as, as we see, so I love it, man. Well, you already mentioned it, but man, I have to say, JDS versus Fabrizio Vadum, like, this came out of the blue. Like, how was it putting this fight together? It's going down, like you said, September 8th in Jacksonville, Florida. This came out of the blue, Jorge. How did you put this fight together? We've been we've been trying to get JDS on the card for some time. He's my teammate from American Top Team, good friend. Um, and I've been telling him, I've been cornering him in the locker room, like, bro, you're gonna come fight for me after practice when he's all tired and stuff. Like, you sign the contract, you can fight for me. He's like, oh, we'll talk, we'll talk. So I've been hounding him, and hounding him. And finally, he he becomes like a free agent, and he's like uh, injury free. And he's like, hey, I want to fight. So I call my uh, good friend and matchmaker Dean Tool, tell him, um, hey, we got a fight in our hands. Um. I got somebody you're very interested in, JDS. And immediately he tells me, you won't believe who I just finished talking to. And I go, who? 
He goes, another heavyweight champion. And I go, no, no way. He goes, yep. Fabricio Verdun is also interested in doing bare knuckle fight. And he'll fight anybody. And I go, bro, this, this can't be. So it took about a month later to, you know, put everything in paper and make sure both sides are good and this and that. And uh, when it got finalized, it was like a very surreal moment because to, to right now, to date, it is the biggest fight I've ever put on as a promoter. And I just feel this is going to take the brand, the company, and everybody involved with it to the next stratosphere. Since since just the fight being announced, the amount of known fighters and unknown fighters that have hit up the DM that, that we have set up for, for talent, it's crazy, man. It's like a, a, a nice roster of individuals. And it's not so much that they're going to fight for me, but it's guys like JDS and Verdum that are breaking those grounds that are going to come fight. So it's it's the top of the food chain, two ex-heavy weight champions. You know, it's crazy. And people maybe don't remember, or certainly newer fans <laughs> perhaps don't know that this is a rematch. You know, they yeah. did throw down at UFC 90 in 2008. So this is like, what, 15 years in the making, this rematch? Mm hmm Yep, this rematch is wild in the making. I feel that uh, the first one was rather quick. The money was on Verdun. Verdun was already savage coming over from Japan. He was doing things already in the UFC. They were, they were going to lead him to the next title shot. And JDS comes out of nowhere and boom, blindsides him with, with an overhand. The fight doesn't even get started before it ends. So it was always like that question, like what would have happened, you know? Obviously, JDS and Verdun both become these superstars and both hold heavyweight championship belts. Verdum, I think, ends up adding a lot more to, to his repertoire. He was more of like a jiu-jitsu guy in the beginning. So then now full-on MMA fighter. And, and JDS has always been one of the more explosive heavyweights I've ever seen, man. He's got the speed and power and the footwork of like a of a lightweight guy. You know, so, man, it's a fight that I'm like, it could go either way, man. I mean, literally, it could go either way. Both these guys are studs. And, and as a promoter with game bread promotions what are you hoping to achieve what's the ceiling of you being a promoter in the fight game right now no ceiling brother just build a good good foundation we got three more shows coming this year we're going to be in uh london we're going to be in december in we're going to be in denver in december and uh, we have another date we're going to drop another location we'll finish out with three shows this year 12 shows next year one show per month so first just keep these guys busy create good content and and see what platform or what network we end up in you know we're obviously like i said we're not building a room so we're not we're not putting ourselves in any parentheses we're just going to build a good groundwork have a have a great content team to record all of that and then put it out there for the masses to see we got a lot of plays. Like I said, we're going to be in England in October, and it's going to be a huge one. I have a, I have a card. Then when I got it announced, I'll gladly come back on here and break it on your show. And you're gonna, you're gonna be excited, man. Especially if there's any British fans in the house. Yeah, yeah. The Brits are gonna, the Brits are going to go nuts. And if there's one thing, you know, as a promoter, there, there's many places I have in my, in my to do. As a fighter, I have like Madison Square Garden, the MGM in Las Vegas the uh, Caesars Palace, the Bellagio, you know, like all the great fight places that, that are known, you know, in Miami, Florida, the, what used to be the American Airlines Arena, all these places were like, I want to go, there's a fighter. As a promoter, I have many countries and arenas that, that I want to go to, and England is definitely one of them because, man, these fans are so educated on fighting and just love violence, you know, they're, they're freaking nuts over there. So I think a bare knuckle show over there is just going to do fantastic. Especially, we're going to mix it up with a good amount of, of British talent to go against whoever it may be. And I think it's going to be a sellout, man. To tell you the truth, I will be announcing the card maybe within the next two weeks. It will be headlining England. So we'll be in contact, brother. Yeah, I mean, going to England, that sounds in incredible. And like yeah. again, like you said, one of some of the most educated uh, and passionate fans in, mm -hmm. in all of the fight game, not just MMA, boxing, bare knuckle, you name it, the fans but come they out. Know. They know. Yeah. They know their MMA over there. I saw you uh, in Vegas recently for for International Fight Week, uh, sure. and just to just to switch things up a little bit, you had an interview with uh, MMA junkies Mike Bond, a previous colleague of mine, and I, kind of, I think there was a, a a question or a pitch about maybe you putting the BMF belt around the winner 
of yeah. Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje, right. Mike then in the post event press co conference pitches this to Dana White and he agreed. So has Dana spoken to you? Is this happening? Is this on? That's what I heard. It's happening. It's on. And, and shout out to my boy for setting that up, huh? I was nice of him. Um, but yeah, it's going to happen. I'm going to go out there, wrap the belt on around the winner. And the tradition lives on. Then the winner of that will wrap the belt on the winner of that and so on and so on. I love it. I mean, when the BMF fight first happened, one of one, right? But but now, because you're retired, it's kind of like there's it's like a legacy belt that's only going to be put on the line when you have two violent fighters. And obviously, Poye and Gaethje definitely check those boxes. Um, what will that mean to you to be in the cage and almost kind of pass that forward, pass that belt forward to the next guy, whoever the winner will be? Uh, it, it means a lot of things to me, you know, in a sense, I'm, I'm done with that chapter in my life competing in MMA at the highest levels. It's the best guys in the world. I'm, I'm, I was 34, 35, 36. I can still do it at that level. I've just slightly slowed down. So now I'm going into my promotion phase and, and as a promoter and, and to give the people the best quality shows that I can. So I'm passing that belt to also that, like the next phase in my life. And this is the mother to watch now. Keep your eyes posted on, on the winner of this because they're a bad mother, you know? So it, it means a lot of things to me. Um, And just, man, a violent fight, you know? You got it in, in, a, in a title fight for the BMF, but the last thing you need is these fans going. They need excitement the whole time. You need to throw and throw hard the whole time. And I think that's what we're going to get in this fight, you know, 100%. I know you're close with, with Dustin, uh, but if you can somehow break the fight down for me in terms of how you think this is actually going to play out for us. I, I think, you know, Justin's going to make a lot of, adjustments maybe setting up for his fight right now with uh with the rematch you know just as i would be thinking don't make the same mistakes that you made before and the coaches will be addressing where he made mistakes and this and that and maybe a new strategy and what to do and what not to do and maybe overemphasize things that were working last time you know um but from what i know from dustin man he's got some new tricks up his sleeve that are just like looking very, very clean in practice. And uh, I think Dustin's going to surprise a lot of people in this fight. Like, and I don't think people will be surprised that he wins. I just, I man, the training that I've been seeing him doing, how he's been doing in the gym, he looks amazing. But I've been hearing from the coaches as well. Um, I, I think he's going to paint a precaution. And is it going to be the same belt, do you know? Or are they going to create a brand new version of that belt? Well, Imagine the belt that I got is mine. Who's going to take that from me? One that, one. That one ain't no one getting but me. I mean, and my kids. You know, imagine someone was like, yo, we need that belt back. Okay, come get it. <laughs> you know, they got to make a duplicate. And, and, you know, not a duplicate. They're making another BMF belt and giving it to them. But mine's is mine's and what's yours is yours, you know? 100. Um, I also saw you recently. Uh, it was kind of bizarre because you you had a face off or interaction with Jake Paul. And immediately I'm thinking, yo, what's going on? Are these are these two about to scrap? Is something going down? And then I see you on the podcast. And I know you and Jake have had a lot of back and forth o over mm -hmm. the years. What is the the status of your relationship with him now? No, nah, good, man. We just strained out a couple of things. There was, you know, some... Uh... Some this and that back and forth. Uh, Woodley's a good friend of mine, and I was advocating for him very hard. I was saying things like he's going to knock out Jake, and Jake didn't really like that. So we, you know, we had some exchange of words and this and that and that and this, but we got to talk in person. Everything was good. It was all love. So um, wish him well, you know, no hard feelings towards him, towards Nate. I don't got problems with anybody. Except everybody knows who I got problems with. But other than that, I'm in, I want all these guys to go out there and make their money, you know? How do you think that fight with the you know Jake and Nate goes down? Obviously, Nate, you know very, very well. Questions. You're gonna answer a lot of questions. Let's see what type of physical conditioning Nate's in. Um, see if also Jake could adjust to that pressure that we all know Nate could put. And then it's boxing, right? So you know you can always clinch and stuff, but you can't really like saw with the grappling like how some people do with Nate. So Nate might be able to put on more combinations, more flurry, step on the gas pedal more, stay in Jake's face, and if. He gets off early to that, and Nate is making Jake run at his pace. 
it's going to be a problem for Jake, you know? Also, on the same note, Jake's been doing boxing. Jake's been training, competing in boxing. Jake's more geared for boxing right now, I would say, than Nate Diaz. Maybe something special could happen. He could, like, stop him, too. He could walk into a shot he doesn't see because it is boxing, you know? So let's uh, let's see what happens. I'm very excited about this one. You know, Jorge, you're someone that had to fight extremely hard in the ring, in the cage, but also had to fight behind the scenes to get your payday and get what you felt as though you were, were owed. I'd love to get your reaction to Francis Ngannou getting the bag with this Tyson Fury fight. What is your reaction to that news? I mean, I love it. Whoever, I, I'm trying to think if any champion's ever been released while being a champion. I don't, I don't think so. Not from the UFC. You know, so on just on that, you have to applaud your head. Just because you took the gamble, right? Without knowing, like, hey, am I going to get any money? I don't know. Then not only is he guaranteeing himself money with the PFL, but he's also going to get this boxing money. It's, it's the greatest playbook right now currently done in MMA, I could say. You know, he's about to make the biggest money ever. Win or lose or draw, whatever happens, he's going to make serious, serious money. And then if it doesn't work out, for him, as we're all expecting it not to, he could always go back to MMA at the PFL and, and do his thing. So I think he hit a hell of a bold pot for himself. Man. Yeah, I mean, I'm still kind of like confused whether this is going to be just the only guy that made the only guy that was has more of a money grab than him is a guy by the name of Lee Murray. He did like the biggest heist in uh, history, and I don't know how many 170 million dollars he sold. That guy's the only guy in MMA that, that, that hit a bigger heist. But what Francis just did right now is is crazy, illegal, you know? Like, insane, bro, that he pulled that off. Like, do you think this is a one-of-one -of -one unicorn story with Francis Ngannou? Or do you think this is something that may have a domino effect on the fight game and we may see other, you know, other fighters in the future try and do something like this again? Combination. Combination. I think people will try it. I think people definitely, definitely will spark a movement for more people going towards it. I think knowing that that's not available. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the Lee Murray uh, situation. I actually had Pat Condellis on my show, the, the filmmaker behind the documentary. Oh, Have you seen the documentary yeah. series? Yeah, pieces of it. I, I got to see the whole thing. I was like on a plane. I started watching it and the Wi Fi went out, but I got to finish watching the whole thing because it's like so well done documentary. And plus, just so it's one of our brothers from Maine. I was always a Lee Murray fan just because of his insane hand speed. So mm -hmm. I, I was noticing the whole thing like uh, in real time when it happened, you know, and I was reading upon it like, no way, this is the craziest thing ever. So it's definitely a documentary that I'll be seeing. Yeah. Um, you obviously mentioned there's one guy that you ha you still have an issue with, but um, one fight that we got so many sick fights to look forward to in 2023. Um, one of them that hasn't officially been announced, but has been talked about a lot is Leon Edwards and Colby Covington. And as someone that knows Colby really, really well, do you give Colby a chance against Leon? Should that fight actually become official and go down? Um, yeah, I know, because Colby could always just turn it into a wrestling match and just hug Leon's leg and not fight and not take part in the fighting at all and just hug his leg and hug his leg harder than, than Leon can get away, and that's a possibility. Um, I hope that Leon drives his knee through Kobe's eye orbit and splatters his eyeball. But uh, who knows? It could be it could be a tough one for Leon as well. Leon's not the best offensive wrestler, you know, like um, Usman, you know. Usman doesn't give him any takedowns and, like, no writing time. Leon's not that same type of defensive wrestler like uh, like Usman, you know, so there could be some problems he could run into as well. Obviously, I know that being a promoter is a big part of your life right now, but I did want to um, also ask about the Mezcal. Like, being an entrepreneur and a businessman, how is the Mezcal doing a few years into the run now? Uh, we're doing well, but we parted ways also um, from, like, many different things. We, we parted ways. They have their stuff now. and It's all theirs now. Kind of give it to them, and I'm, and I'm just doing my own thing, man. Okay, okay, interesting. Um, well, look, Oh, hey, I appreciate the time very much. The way I like to end a lot of these kind of like conversations that I have is something called the bit for social. And so for you, I thought it would be fun. 
quick fire. I'm going to just reel off a bunch of fights and I want you to give me the the rating out of 10 for the violence meter, right? Okay. So how violent you think these fights are going to be out of 10. And we'll start off with Dustin Poirier versus Justin Gaethje for the BMF belt. I mean, this has the potential to be the most violent fight in, in a sense, you know. D Dustin's literally like a dog, you know. You could hit him, you could bite him, you could do, but he doesn't get discouraged. Uh, Gage is very much like the same, you know. He gets hit and he goes Homer Simpson mode and he keeps getting hit and keeps coming forward. So this this fight is always one that I think that these type of athletes, combatants, have a lot of dog in them. So this has the potential to hit the max scale of violence always. So that's going to be a 10, I would imagine, yeah? Has the potential to hit a 10 for sure. Okay. What about Jake Paul versus Nate Diaz? Um. Yeah, definitely the, the potential of violence. I'm gonna say a nine. You know, maybe Nate's not in the best shape, and he's, you know, sitting back a little bit more, waiting for Jake, which I don't see that happening. But even then, it would still be fine. I I just see that fight being violent as well. Mm -hmm. Junior dos Santos versus Fabrizio Verdum in Bernacol MMA. I mean, the first one with gloves ended in a minute and change. Violence from the start to finish. Now no gloves. I think this has like an 11 on it. What about John Jones versus Steve Miocic? Is that a fight official, official now? Because then I, it's I just official. heard it wasn't official. Then it's I heard, official. It's official as it gets. 100%. I, it, you know, I think this could be one of the better fights ever in the UFC. Heavyweight well, division. Yeah. I think that Steve has some things that are going to give John's problems. Like he's naturally a bigger man, right? And he wrestled. Steve could wrestle. He's wrestled with Cormier. He's wrestled with the best of them, and he holds his own. Obviously, John Jones is different, bigger, longer, stronger. I, uh, I'm i very interested to see how that goes. And then if Steve is making him stand, Steve has good hands, which is John Jones' is maybe his boxing isn't the best, but I'm talking about the elbows, knees, clinching, kicks. John could, could take anybody out. So it's, it's one of these fights that they both have their strength. And they kind of both play into each other because also Miotovic is not going to be able to take down John Jones and control him. He's not going to be able to outscramble him most of the time. I think he could defend some takedowns and and definitely give him a lot more of a problem than than uh, Surreal Gan in the wrestling department. You know, now if John, if somebody's wrestling back into him and they're naturally heavier man, maybe things could happen. You know, as Miotovic is more accustomed to being that heavyweight, holding that weight, I think it's going to be fight of the year. Um, it's hard to bet against Jones, though. I just don't care what weight it is. If you're asking me who's going to win, it's hard to bet against John Jones. But I, I think Steven might pose one of the stiffest challenges of his whole career. And on that meter from zero to 10 in terms of violence? I could see being very methodical. Both guys, you know, being very strategic or being very violent. It'd be like nine of violence. You know, but I, I think mostly they're going to be more cerebral. I, I, I don't know why I see this fight being more cerebral. Um, more strategy base, more timing base. Who's getting better takedowns? Things like that. You know. What about Israel Adesanya versus Drikas Duplessis? Obviously, a very heated exchange the other day in Vegas. It's hype. It's all the fireworks. I mean, you ever you ever got a guy like Izzy in this? Always fireworks. Duplessis is a freaking animal. He's throwing shots from everywhere. Like you, you don't know where. He's hitting you with the, everything in the kitchen sink. Um, relentless pressure as well. And just like basically overnight, a lot of people are not talking about it. Like this guy just started doing good and then took off, you know, eliminating contenders. Now, um, they, when, you, when you're in boxing, this is a boxing term, they say you don't box a boxer and you don't brawl a brawler, you know? Maybe something so different from Izzy Styles to style to beat him because you're not gonna out strike Izzy in a nice conventional way. You're the the guy's timing, distance, the way he reads people. He's gonna have to make it like an ugly brawl and, and catch him. Then kind of like the Kevin Gastelum fight, you know, where I know Izzy was a lot younger in his career, that, but it was a lot more of a fight because Kevin was making it like a fight fight. You know, he wasn't giving him that distance. He was right in his chest. It was like a fight fight. And they were both going at it. I definitely feel that uh, maybe Dupree can have a lot of success in that uh, in that category, like a lot of success, you know. But Izzy's Izzy, man.
And again, on that scale of zero to 10, where would you rank it in terms of violence? Oh, that fight could be so violent. 10. That and, could be a 10. Sure. And the final two I got for you. Uh, give me Francis Ngannou versus Tyson Fury on a scale of zero to 10. I think no matter what, maybe I can see some rounds like feel out process, but no matter what, at some point in that fight, it turns into one of the most violent things in the world. I give it a 10. I think there'll be a lot of like studying in the beginning. And then hold on to your seats. And the final one, it's not official yet. Will we see it in 2023? Will it spill into 2024? But regardless, Conor McGregor versus Michael Chandler. On a scale of 0 to 10, how violent do you think that fight could be? Man, you got to first pass this thing called the USADA drug test. So I don't see that midget passing that, bro. I, I don't think, uh, I don't think, um, Mac Chicken's going to freaking ever pass the USADA test, bro. So. Or maybe he does next year. I don't know. So first you got to do that, man. It's just respect the sport. You're saying you're coming back into the sport, but you haven't missed failed attempts for you. Sort of like, man, you know, respect the sport, you know. So I, I ain't even giving him no, no shine like that. You didn't even show up to the first part of the fight, man. Get the fuck out of here, man. Oh, hey, you're the man. By the way, these breakdowns have been fantastic. Like, seriously, like, are, have you thought about doing commentary or some, uh, like, analysis work on a YouTube channel or something? Because I think you'd be fantastic at it, to be honest. I don't pay enough, man. Fair, 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 fair. Just, You know, you know, it does pay a lot of money putting on these fights. So that's why I put on my brain power. But remember, the, the analyzing, it, it just didn't come as a gift to me. It's from years of years of analyzing footage for myself, from my teammates. For coaches asking me for another athlete, hey, what do you think for this guy? Because you have a good striking style for guys like this type. What do you do? This and that. So I've, it's just part of the game to like break down film and, and analyze it. And then, you know, the strategy behind it and stuff like that, a lot of it, I lived it or, or have to avoid it or do it myself to win fights. So I understand a lot of it. It's my wheelhouse. But no, nah, I wouldn't. That commentating stuff, they don't like to pay money, man. And they got you in the suit. And then they want you here at this time and you got to come back at this time and then you got to have a meeting after. And then the next day they want another meeting and then the emails and this. And I'm like, that ain't me, man. You know, fair, fair play. Well, what it is you is game bread. Bare knuckle MMA is going down. JDS for Britsu Wadoom, two of the greatest heavyweights of all time doing it bare knuckle style. It's going to be going down September 8th, Jacksonville. Florida. I can't wait. Like you said, this is the biggest fight that you put on as a promoter. And I can't wait to see what other announcements you have up your sleeve later on this year. I'm com I'm coming on your show to break them. Tickets available at ticketmaster.com. Love it. Well, hey, you're the man. I appreciate you coming on. Stay in touch and the best of luck with promoting this fight. I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come break the October card and hopefully by then we already got the grappler signed. I'll let everybody Let's, know, bro. Let go, let go. Let's do it. Appreciate it, George. Take care. Thank you, brother. Peace out.